The Von Dorn Lecture is in honor of Jacques Von Dorn, who is the founder of the Department of Sociology here in Rotterdam. He's also the founder of the what was then called the faculty. You'll see we've had a name change. We're now called the Erasmus School of uh, Social and Behavioral Sciences, and our dean is seated there on the first row. Um, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Um, Jacques von Dorn established sociology, or that was his view, and we still see it as a signature of sociology in Rotterdam today. The signature is clear policy relevance, which is, we also call it sociology that matters, so a clear consideration of what the implications are of findings for society at large or for policy, but also a critical reflection on policy itself. And it's not surprising that we now joined sociology, public administration, and it was more or less a natural move to join them, given our focus on policies. The Van Dorn chair has had two previous holders. One was Kees Schout. I don't think he requires an introduction, background in both law and in sociology. A prominent professor in Leiden, Utrecht, but also at the University of Amsterdam, and he's had very many um, prestigious functions. One of them included a position at the Dutch Scientific Council for Government Policy, which also goes, interestingly enough, for the second chair holder, Mark Bovens, uh, professor of public administration in Utrecht, and who's currently one of the members of the Dutch Scientific Council for Government Policy. Now, Evelyn Ruppert who is spending a, some, a number of months here in the Netherlands, not only as the Van Dorn Fellow, but also combined with that is a fellowship at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Studies, which we all know as NIOS. And I was just talking to her, and she's one of the few people who has an apartment on the Kloveniersbergwald, that's next to the building of the Royal Academy of Sciences. And I was a member of the board when we had those apartments built. And at the, f the first year, we were terrified that the fellows didn't want to leave because those apartments are so gorgeous. Um, so Evelyn, and I'm no doubt that the fact you're in such lovely circumstances will help you um, reach even greater brilliance than you have so far. Um, Evelyn is a Canadian. Um, working at Goldsmiths, uh, college, the University of London. Um, it, I looked at her CV and you come from urban planning, you come from geography, moving very much towards sociology and a brand of critical sociology and a clear interest in infrastructures, data infrastructures. Several awards, I'm not going to mention all of them, but the ones that struck me were the President's Dissertation Scholarship Award of York University. That's also, that's in Toronto, that's where you did your PhD. The Outstanding Leadership Award of the Social Media and Society Organization, that was very recent, 2016. Um, the, you were in, in, I thought that was very prestigious, an invited delegate to the World Economic Forum. That's not a status many of us reach, and that was only last year. And, um, and you weren't aware of this, but I just told you this. Um, I was on the panel that decided, that was the ERC Consolidator Grant Panel, to award you um, a grant. And we were very, very pleased with what you were doing. And this is for the project called Arithmus. And it's, um, it's I'm gonna give you the long title. It's called Peopling Europe, How Data Make a People. And it's about the decisions that are made by statistical offices. And you think, is this interesting? Yes, because they have far reaching implications. And that's the topic of the project. And a spin-off will also be the topic of uh, your talk today. Themes of your work, big data, digital citizenship, 
And so there's a critical examination of the relationship between states and citizens in the production of knowledge. We're delighted to have you and delighted that you will be giving a talk or a lecture on socio-technical imaginaries of different data futures, an experiment in citizen data. The floor is yours. Dean Beckers, uh, Professor Dijkstra, colleagues of the Erasmus University Rotterdam and of the Dutch and Flemish Sociological Associations, colleagues of NIAS, ladies and gentlemen. It has been a really great privilege uh, to hold the Honorary Van Dorn Chair at Erasmus along with a fellowship at NIAS, which you've just heard about. I'm also very pleased uh, to deliver this lecture as part of the Day of Sociology. It is an honor also to be the third chair to deliver this lecture, but also the first to do so in English. During the past several months, I've learned uh, much about uh, Jacques Van Dorn. Many um, Dutch colleagues have spoken to me about his history, and I've had the albeit limited opportunity to read some of his uh, writings in English. I've also gained some insight about his work from uh, the 2012 lecture of the first holder of the honor, or I think the second holder of the honorary chair, Professor Mark Bovens of Utrecht. In the opening to his lecture, he referred to how Van Dorn, in his first book, written in 1954, refuted the argument that there was a strong social divide in the Netherlands between unskilled and skilled workers. Rather, he argued that the working class was significantly more differentiated. In his lecture, Bovens noted that almost 50 years later, Van Dorn expressed less certainty about that earlier argument, and he suggested that actually what was in question was more generally the recognizable but perhaps less pertinent social science classifications of class. In their place, he noted that other group distinctions such as gender, age, and employment status were becoming perhaps more relevant and prominent divisions and making things much more complicated and diffuse. It was against this background that Bovens then went on to argue that not, notwithstanding Van Dorn's reconsideration of class distinctions, the information society was leading to new, or at least newly visible, dividing lines or ruptures, and one source was differences in education. Now, in ways I could not have anticipated, my lecture engages with these debates, albeit from a different set of concerns about class distinctions, power relations, and the information society. My concern is how digital technologies are generative of struggles over who owns, who has access to, and who controls the making and circulation of data and knowledge of societies. It is a concern that Francois Lyotard expressed in the 1980s about computerization, which he argued was turning knowledge into a new mode of production and power relations. It was remaking knowledge and its distribution and resulting in new forms of class distinction and capital, which Pierre Bourdieu named cultural capital. For Lyotard, the question was, who will know? Perhaps the time has come to also ask, how will we know? I will approach these questions by first reflecting on recent political struggles over data and truth. It's well known now that Facebook data breaches and election influencing of Cambridge Analytica, along with claims about alternative facts, are making it a challenging time to deliver a lecture about a research experiment that involves designing an app for citizen data. Of course, it is a challenge that extends to all researchers who are experimenting with apps and platforms for doing research. But it is moments such as this that also afford an opportunity or an opening to imagine different data futures. How Facebook data was used to interfere in the US election and UK referendum has been joined by the disclosure that the personal information of up to 87 million users was harvested without their permission by an app designed by a Cambridge academic. The seriousness of this breach intensified when Cambridge Analytica claimed that hundreds of companies harvest such data and that it is legal to do so. Or when the Cambridge academic at the center of the controversy claimed that it was both legal and ethically acceptable to sell data to a third party. Or when CEO Mark Zuckerberg on his apology tour admitted that Facebook took no action to ensure that the tens of thousands of apps it approved adhered to their terms of service. 
I think a main lesson to draw is not that an academic, an internet platform, and a data company are all culpable. Rather, it is that data and politics are inseparable. And so whether we are academics or app developers, we cannot be naive, but we need to be reflexive about how we may be implicated in the ways that data is part of emerging power relations. For data is not only shaping social relations, but also our very democratic politics. Now, one possible response would be to abandon research that engages with digital technologies such as apps and what has come to be labeled as big data. Would that then mean to accept that the current trajectory of data politics is inexorable? Would that mean to accept that the history of our present is given? These questions are evident in reactions that data produced by various digital technologies are a threat and menace, or the obverse response that extol their virtues and merits and say they're at least improving our lives and this is a price we have to pay. That the proliferation of digital technologies and data have contributed to competing knowledge has fueled similar reactions about the threat of alternative facts. While some reactions are that this represents a democratization of knowledge and the erosion of the domination of experts, we know the separation between true and false is never straightforward. Such a dichotomy belies how all facts are produced and mediated by complex practices and technological infrastructures and are full of uncertainties. The division between the real and the fictitious is vexed. There are no truths and falsehoods independent of the knowledge regimes that produce them. For this reason, I doubt that the politics, epitomized by Trump and his followers, heralds a new era of post-truth. Rather, it signals the emergence of new regimes of truth. Thus, we need to understand how an asymmetrical view of truth enables emerging politically and economically powerful groups to now assume the posture of epistemic underdogs, as Michael Lynch recently argued. Yet, a prominent reaction has been the proliferation of expert practices to now authenticate facts in order to restore authority. For example, Open Europe's data fact-check blog is where European experts distinguish EU fact from EU fiction. And that curiously brings me back to Facebook, which after the 2016 US presidential election, launched an initiative that engages such third-party fact-checking organizations to fight misinformation on its platform. This has led to numerous challenges, such as who will now fact-check the fact-checkers. However, rather than restoring authority, these efforts only amplify the binary and truth-making as a struggle between different gatekeepers, intermediaries, and validators. It treats citizens as needing experts to validate facts for them. I think the, fact, the reaction also demonstrates the significance of critiques of the epistemic authority and command of experts. Those critiques have called for epistemic justice, for example, about the setting of priorities for what matters and how knowledge is made, which are central to democratic politics, as Sheila Jasanoff has argued. However, by speaking of experts in the general, the reaction also conceals how experts compete to maintain their relative authority and position within particular fields of knowledge, as Bourdieu has argued. Different factions of experts, from journalists and state statisticians to academics, compete and struggle over the authority to legitimate facts about matters of public concern, such as climate change and migration. I suggest that these struggles and reactions are openings for thinking about da different data futures through what I call an experiment in citizen data. It is an experiment that reconsiders relations between states, citizens, and digital technologies in the production of data and statistics by imagining a new political subjectivity, that of the data citizen. Before elaborating on these openings in the first part of the lecture, I reflect on how social technical imaginaries of big data drive and frame these struggles. I then turn to how these are at work and have effects within a particular field of practice, which I refer to as the transnational field of statistics. One effect that I outline is how the repurposing of big data imagines subjects as passive actants and individual privacy regulators. Now, no doubt anyone who engages with digital technologies in the EU has experienced the call to be an individual privacy regulator through the implementation of the General Data Protection Regulation, or the GDPR. We are now given ever more fine-grained ways of regulating what, when, and how data can be produced about us. During the past several weeks, we have been inundated with emails from organizations notifying us of changes to privacy policies and how to take action to remain on mailing lists. 
I've lost count of the number of emails that I have received from companies and some organizations I didn't even know existed and who have collected various kinds of data about me. While important and very satisfying to opt not for future communications, data rights are confined to consenting to the collection of data and the sending of emails. But how we might intervene or interfere in the production and interpretation of data to which we agree or consent is not a matter of concern. This is an issue I will take up in the second part of my lecture when I describe an ongoing experiment that imagines subjects as data citizens with the right to shape how data is made about them and the societies of which they are a part. My lecture draws from research on the, university, or on the European Research Council project that uh, uh, Professor Dijkstra mentioned earlier, which is called Arithmus for short. It's a project that is broadly concerned with the practical and political implications of methods for knowing the European population, and amongst other things, experiments with new digital technologies such as smartphones, tablets, and web platforms to produce data for official statistics, and with big data such as that from mobile phones, search engines, and social media as possible new data sources. Methodologically, um, I have studied these issues along with five researchers through what we describe as a multi-sided, multi-method collaborative ethnography of the data practices of EU national and international statistical institutes. I would like here to acknowledge and thank them and note that though they are now all moving on to new positions, we continue to collaborate and write together and I'm very grateful for their contributions, commitment and collegial support throughout this project. My lecture basically consists of reflections on a series of working papers and articles that I have authored and various combinations of us have co-authored and how that work led to an experiment in citizen data. So what does it mean to reimagine relations between states and citizens in the production of data and statistics? As many theorists have argued, imaginaries require acts of imagination to express what they are and to pass from being a symbol to being something more. In other words, they are symbols not because they do not correspond to a reality, but because they require imagination instituted and maintained by myriad collectives to enact them. This is a sense of the imaginary originally coined by philosopher Cornelius Castoriadis, who explored the force of the social imagination and its political implications. He argued that to understand what holds societies together requires understanding its institutions, and the Im imaginaries they require, but whose functioning and effects are not guaranteed. Benedict Anderson also famously engaged with the force of imaginaries in his well-known definition of a nation as an imagined political community. It is through shared imaginaries that technologies of power, such as the census, the map, and the museum, were organized historically and came to shape how colonial states governed their subjects and their territories. Following Anderson's approach, Charles Taylor recognized that social imaginaries were integral to the making of modernity, where politics have not simply involved the rational negotiation of ends, but moral orientations to what should or could be. Willem Sinkel from Erasmus University, in his recent book, Imagined Societies, expands on these themes to argue that social imagination is a key process in all social life and that society is not an entity that exists independently of its imagination. Importantly, he examines this by tracing discourses of policymakers, politicians and bureaucrats on immigrant integration in Western Europe to critique a conception of social imaginaries advanced by Taylor as stable and consensus-driven rather than objects of conflict and struggles against domination. Sinkel, while exploring discourses as the ordering of what can be said and thought, extends this to other technical mediums such as graphs and tables through which imaginaries are also defined and negotiated. In these and other ways, imaginaries have been conceived as shaping large-scale social processes and grand patterns of nationhood, societies, and modernity. With some exceptions, they have understood imaginaries as ideational constructs. This is a point of departure for researchers in science and technology studies, or STS, which Sheila Jasanoff has summarized in her account of social technical imaginaries. Taking the work of Arjun Naparadai on globalization and diasporas as a starting point, she argues that universalized phenomena, such as modernity, consist of disjointed flows or overlapping, but not necessarily coherent, social practices. 
However, as she further notes, Apadurai, while moving away from master narratives, still conceived of imaginaries as ideational. It is this observation that leads her to specify a second point of departure in SDS, which is to account for the intricate workings of modernity's two most salient forces, science and technology, in the performance of imaginaries. For our present time, I think some of the most forceful socio-technical imaginaries concern those about digital technologies and big data. From the internet as both liberating and enslaving to autonomous yet murderous cars, one that has and continues to have force is that of a big data revolution. But what exactly is big data remains a concern or a matter of some debate, and it can include everything from that generated by social media, browsers and digital transactions, to that from mobile phones, emails, text messages, electricity meters, sensors, and travel cards. But my use of it here is not to accept the way it's being defined, but to consider its imaginary force. In that regard, the most predominant definition of the so-called three Vs of volume, velocity, and variety is the most uh, prominent one that circulates, and it's the most off-cited, debated, and vague, and yet accepted definitions whose take-up, I think, demonstrates two things. First, what each of the Vs means is hugely variable, such that the force of big data imaginaries is not in the definition, but how its functioning provokes valuations of qualities of data, such as speed, real-time, granularity, quantity, flexibility, scalability, extensity, and reach. Second, the focus on these qualities obscures the socio-technical practices through which data is being produced and analyzed by myriad organizations, corporations, institutions, and so on that has fueled imaginaries of it as a revolutionary force. Now, following from Castoriadis, the force of big data is not so much in proclamations, but in the acts of imaginations of such collectives through which it is passing from a symbol to something more. The collective of interest to my argument is that which makes up what we have conceived of as the transnational field of statistics. In brief, drawing on Bourdieu's conception of fields, it consists of myriad stakeholders and professional factions who occupy relative positions such as statistician, demographer, methodologist, information technologist, programmer, and so on, who operate across the private and public sectors. But rather than a national space, as Bourdieu studied, they operate in simultaneously domestic and transnational fields, as DJ Bigo has argued, in relation to security, and they compete with one another over the recognition of forms of capital that shape their relative positions and, in turn, relative power and authority. I will not go into detail, but instead highlight that there are numerous stakes between differently positioned professions, and one concerns the recognition of forms of cultural capital advanced by the rise of one faction, which primarily emerged within the private sector and which claims possession of the skills, knowledge, and techniques to analyze big data, that of the data scientist. Imaginaries of big data include now the powers of this profession, which is shaping the way statisticians simultaneously are thinking about the future of their profession and institutes. Beyond learning new skills, such as working with algorithms and complex models, it involves valorizing and acquiring what Bourdieu referred to as new dispositions, such as being agile, adaptable, creative, and innovative, and adopting new mentalities and ways of thinking about data. For statistical institutes, it means investing in resources and new infrastructures and training programs. In brief, all of the investments necessary to experiment and innovate in ways that accord with the competition. To speak, then, of dominant imaginaries is to underscore that they not only shape what is thinkable, but also practices through which actors are performing them. So while some commentators declare that big data is hype, these pronouncements underestimate the material and political effects that are happening and through which uh, these pronouncements are also taking up imaginaries and doing it through practices which are shaping new ways of thinking and new ways of thinking are also being propagated. For the transnational field of statistics, one effect is also what Bourdieu refers to as the power to make things, or in other words, the epistemic authority over the enactment of the objects of statistics, such as economies and populations. That is the power to make data and in turn what comes to be performed as knowledge and truth. However, it is the other side of this power 
what I refer to as the power to produce subjects, that concerns me here and which brings me back to what I highlighted in the introduction to this lecture. Who are the subjects of big data? All methods produce their subjects. They are configured in ways that imagine who are their subjects and how they should, can, and will likely perform. For example, the dominant method of statistical institutes, the modern paradigm of the census questionnaire and survey, typically imagines and engages with people as respondents and data subjects. While not without problems and without wanting to idealize questionnaires, they involve direct relations with subjects who are called upon to participate in their identification, but who can thereby also exercise the capacity to not answer, subvert questions, challenge categories, and so on. Historically, there are many examples of how people have variously influenced, interfered, or intervened in the ways questionnaires have imagined them as respondents and obedient data subjects by, for example, challenging social categories such as on race, ethnicity, and gender. Critical citizenship studies offers a way to interpret these as acts of citizenship where being a citizen is understood as a political subjectivity that includes not only the possession of rights, but the right to make rights claims. With this conception, subjects who perform in ways not anticipated by a method and who would demand identifications that are not recognized can be understood as performing as data citizens by claiming the right to shape how data is made about them and the populations of which they are being constituted as a part. Methods of data production such as questionnaires have enabled such contestations in part because of the affordances of the social technical arrangements that make them up. From open text fields enabling the insertion of elective categories to skipping or refusing to respond to questions, the method has variously afforded such contestations, reinterpretations and resignifications. One condition of this possibility is that they involve more or less direct and explicit relations between statistical institutes and subjects. So how then does big data transform relations between subjects and methods of data production? Subjects are imagined as passive actants where technologies are one-way tools for extracting data about them. Through subjects' digital interactions and transactions with platforms and devices, such as social media, mobile phones, and browsers, data is produced without their knowledge and through processes that often work in the background. Furthermore, while that data is used for purposes such as the functioning and performance of a technology such as a platform, data can also be repurposed. This is one of the valuations promoted in big data imaginaries, the possibility of the commodification of data through its circulation and its reuse for purposes beyond that which data were originally generated. Data are imagined independent of the relations that brought them into being, but also from subjects who are imagined as passive actants. Data then are interpreted as simple representations of behaviors who are, of who are subjects, what they think, and what they do. Now, the many exploitive consequences of this repurposing of big data in relation to the commercial agendas of technology corporations are well documented. And to return to my opening remarks, it is the repurposing of Facebook data by an academic to do psychological profiling and by a corporation to intervene in democratic elections that have fueled current struggles. Much critical attention is being paid to what this means for data protection, ownership, privacy, and consent, and effects such as profiling, the filtering of choices, and the influencing of opinions. However, what such criticisms underestimate are the implications of separating data from their conditions of production and interpreting them as simple reflections. Indeed, the deleterious effects of repurposing are resolved by reducing subjects to the role of individual privacy regulators. Another implication is that repurposing also constitutes a detachment in the relation between states and citizens in the production of data. It means adopting data that is implicated in the rationalities, assumptions, interests, and norms of private sector professionals and technology corporations. If epistemic authority is indeed a stake, then it means delegating some of that authority to them. It also means relegating to others relations to subjects as users, consumers, and data sources, and which makes the capacity of subjects to perform as data citizens in the ways I have expressed more difficult, if not impossible. However, the force of big data imaginaries is not simply to be found in whether or not big data has been or will be actually repurposed for official statistics. 
It is also to be found in the adoption of new mindsets and paradigms that take cues from how data is imagined and produced by private technology corporations and analyzed by data scientists. It's to be found in how such imaginaries are simultaneously reconfiguring cultures and practices of data production on the part of both statistical professions and their institutes. Now, many of these arguments come from our research and analyses of the discourses of statisticians about big data and digital technologies, as well as ethnographic fieldwork that involved observing their debates about and experiments with big data. These are techniques that are core to the ethnographic method and involve following and analyzing the words and practices of research subjects across various field sites and to then engage them in critique. It was through this method that we came to think about how statisticians imagined their future relations between citizens and digital technologies. Along with postdoctoral researchers Francisca Gromet and Funda Ustek Spilda, I then asked how might we do critique differently? How might we do this by designing a method of data production that mobilizes the interactive and inventive possibilities of digital technologies and which does not treat subjects as passive actants but rather as data citizens? It is in relation to these questions that we drew on approaches to experimentation in STS as a way to demonstrate different possible futures. We decided to engage in an experiment that involves setting up what George Marcus calls parasites. Rather than observing conventional field sites, parasites involve organizing an overlapping academic and field work space for testing and developing ideas with research subjects, not as informants, but as collaborators. So we conceived of parasites as a way to change our subject positions from that of social science researchers and statisticians to that of participants. In this way, we joined others in SDS who adopt experimentation as a method and a mode of participation. Rather than treating experiments as objects of our study, it involves approaching them as a method of doing research. One mode concerns political experimentation where the objective is not only participation, but to interrupt ingrained styles of thinking and doing. It's an approach that goes beyond a discursive mode of participation by building and designing things that reconfigure relations between people and technologies, and in that way imagine different distributions of power and agency. Practice research is one such version that approaches research through an engagement with the skills, materials, the task and labor involved in making things, instead of primarily relying on text and spoken word, as Kat Jungnickel has stated it. Building something rather than critiquing through discourse produces an entanglement with research subjects and matters of concern. Through experiencing the confusion and failure that are part of making and designing, the aim is to make present the hidden skills, assumptions, and technical arrangements that are part of the making of a thing. Now, it's with that spirit that we have been organizing a series of parasites for imagining states, citizens, and digital technologies as co-producers of data for official statistics through the design of a thing we named a citizen data app. We conceived of designing an app as a way to explore different data futures through creative experimentation that can lure other possible ways of thinking about relations to data. The first parasite took the form of a collaborative design workshop involving arithmetic researchers, statisticians, other academic researchers, information and interaction designers, and facilitators from the WAG Society here in the Netherlands. Four groups developed principles, designed prototypes, and proposed roadmaps for developing four different apps. Rather than attempt to summarize what we came up with, I will highlight one imaginary I observed in the group that I was part of. Basically, the group designed an app called How We Move to explore the different meanings of and relations citizens have to mobility that defy usual statistical categories of where people live and work. One proposition put forward was that existing statistical categories about what is called a subject's usual place of residence do not capture the complexity of mobilities in contemporary cultures. Among other things, the group considered how these categories could be rethought through an app that mixed automatically collected GPS data along with citizen annotations, interpretations, and categorizations of their and others' mobility patterns. A tension emerged between the introduction of design elements that created possibilities for citizens to engage with data in these ways that I've just spoken about versus those that aim to control data collection, standardization, and quality. 
Now, not maybe a surprising dynamic, but rather than resolving the tension, one solution offered was that co-produced data could be treated as a hybrid form based on different quality standards, yet generative of unique and perhaps previously unimagined kinds of statistics. In subsequent conservation uh, conversations and debates, statisticians then spoke of co-produced data as complementary rather than a replacement of existing data, a term they often called forth when a new and unsanctioned form of data is innovated. That is, relegating co-produced data to a special status was a strategy of accepting it while at the same time retaining the authority of existing methods of data production. However, for me, it also signified another potential. It signified that there is not one set of standards through which data can be produced and made official. Indeed, if there is any one conclusion from our years of fieldwork, it is that in practice, such variability is a condition of all methods, from how surveys are conducted to how administrative registers are organized. Adherence to standards, norms, conventions, rules, and principles varies to the extent that what can become official is not settled or measurable by any single standard, but is something that is collectively negotiated, instituted, and maintained. To note this is to underscore that the practices of different social and technical collectives may involve different forms of reasoning that adhere, adhere to different principles and standards. As Jennifer Gabrice and Helen Pritchard argue, standards such as measurement accuracy are not the only criteria for evaluating environmental data gathered through, for example, citizen sensing practices. They note that when a rough measurement to identify a pollution event when it is happening, or when it has happened, might be sufficient and good enough. In other words, methods can be evaluated according to different norms, objectives, and standards. And in the case of our experiment, the relations and collectives that bring data into being, rather than their truth claims. To imagine complementary data, then, is to offer a different way of accomplishing what counts as official. However, and critically, this interpretation does not mean according uh, complementary data the status of alternative facts. Earlier, I argued against fact-checking as an answer to the evaluation of competing facts, in part because it disregards critiques of the epistemic authority and command of experts. What is at stake is not which experts win the authority to legitimize facts or what counts as official data and statistics. Rather, I suggest it is the norms and values on which public facts are being legitimized, including the relations of production that are instituted and negotiated by social and technical collectives that enact them. So the prototyping of the How We Move app introduced how population categories can also be rethought through a design experiment. This is what we will explore in a second parasite that will involve academic researchers, information and technology designers, and citizen groups. We decided to focus on the category of mobility in part because it frequently came up as a concern during our field work. Additionally, it addresses a fundamental basis of population statistics, which in contemporary times is referred to as the category of a usual residence. That is, determining a single usual residence for each subject is the foundation of a governing rationality of knowing which subjects to count, or in other words, who are the subjects of governing within specific political jurisdictions. While states have adopted many definitions of who to count, an internationally agreed standard has been adopted by the EU for the purposes of determining which subjects belong to which state jurisdiction for the purposes of comparability and to avoid the double or multiple counting of subjects. The definition is called the 12-month rule. Basically, subjects are those persons who have their place of usual residence in the country of the census reference time and have lived or intend to live there for a continuous period of time of at least 12 months. However, a recurring problem are those subjects who cannot be easily placed in a usual residence, for which there are numerous exceptions and particular cases, such as higher education students, circular migrants, seasonal and cross-border workers, homeless people, reconstructed families, transnational academics, citizens who have residences in two or more countries, and so on. Arguably, many modes of living have historically been at odds with governmental definitions of what constitutes being resident, and it is and has always been a variable condition of humanity because of choice, circumstance, law, or force. However, our current moment presents a puzzle that I have been trying to work out that goes beyond ontological differences about what constitutes a usual residence. 
One conjecture is that the definition is a response to a tension between two knowledge and governing regimes of national ones problematizing mobility and an international regime that enables it. What is usually expressed by statisticians as the need to standardize and harmonize a definition obscures this fundamental tension. To further explore this, rather than critiquing the definition, our proposition is to rethink the category. Rather than beginning with usual residents and then identifying rules for addressing exceptions and special cases, we will begin with the unusual to experiment with how residents might be reimagined through categories that accord with the multiplicity of modes of living. That is, we will take exceptions as the rule and ask, what would happen if we unlocked the definition of a population from its historical connection to a residence? On this point, we will follow STS researchers who attend to the multiplicities of a phenomenon and bring into question practices that seek to make them singular and centered on one meaning, as John Law and Anna Marie Mole have maintained. We will thus make multiplicity of modes of living as a starting point. In these ways, the experiment can produce other categories, not as reflections of a reality, but of acts of imagination that also re recognize their political effects. For it is through claiming different categories that citizens have historically sought recognition and data and demanded and claimed social and political rights. In our case, categories of modes of living might destabilize assumptions that mobility is only a condition of migrants or challenge how decisions made on the allocation of resources do not meet the social rights of mobile people. To note this is to underscore that imagining data citizens not only calls for epistemic justice about how data is made, it also calls for justice in the making of knowledge upon which social and political rights are founded and distributed. We offer this starting point also in consideration of two conditions of contemporary cultures, that new modes of living are also being facilitated by digital technologies, such as distance working and long distance relationships of care and support, and at the same time, digital technologies afford the possibility of co-producing categories that also accord with the lives of data citizens. Ontologically and methodologically, the method of the next parasite, it will engage with digital technologies in this tool, dual way. It will involve workshops with citizen groups who constitute some of those exceptions that start with different social technical imaginaries, not for the purposes of producing data on mobility, but to probe a fundamental category of official statistics and governing. The history of our present marks an emerging transformation in data production. I've set out in this lecture that the relations between states, citizens, and digital technologies in this transformation are not inevitable and that different data futures are possible. I've suggested one that imagines a new political subjectivity, that of the data citizen. Now, this may be literally unthinkable for some. However, it is again through acts of imagination by collectives that start from somewhere different, not with solutions to problems predefined, but through practices of invention and experimentation that different futures can be performed. So while examples such as the Facebook data breaches may dominate the headlines, there are numerous initiatives that imagine different data futures. A telling example is Border Sessions, a yearly tech culture festival focused on ideas and experiments that engage with technology as an instrument for positive change. The seventh edition is recently, or currently, I should say, taking place in various venues across The Hague, and it consists of co-creation labs and a conference that involves participants, participants from both the public and private sectors. For example, one lab is being led by a group called the Data Commons, an association of citizens that wants to recapture the right to self-determination over their own data. This is just one example of performing different data futures. Our experiment is to imagine yet another that involves new relations between states, citizens, and digital technologies. Experiments, of course, can lead to dangerous outcomes, such as potentially co-opting subjects or reproducing passive forms of participation, such as those involved in the production of big data. They could also lead to making citizens responsible for participating, rather than affording opportunities to perform as data citizens. I think such outcomes are conceivable, given the ascendancy of governing rationales that imagine citizens as subjects to be trained and responsibilized for everything from digital literacy to digital etiquette to digital privacy. Acknowledging such possible outcomes is to recognize that acts of imagination that break from dominant ones is a formidable challenge. 
However, to experiment requires not be beginning again with preconceived notions of what constitutes success or failure, but to be reflexive about outcomes and their possible consequences. And finally, it is again at a moment of political fragility that experimenting can also offer different data futures, not of data-driven knowledge as is often being proclaimed, but perhaps of democratically driven knowledge. To conclude, many of the issues raised in relation to methods, data production, and official statistics are also ones that we grapple with in the social sciences. Questions about our relations to data subjects or data citizens and of how we participate in dominant imaginaries or break through to new ones are also our challenge, I would say. If data and politics are inseparable in the ways I suggested in the introduction, then this calls for reflexivity about how we may be implicated and the part we play in emerging power relations. Colleagues, it is really a great honor to have held the Van Dorn Honorary Chair. I am especially grateful to Willem Sinkel, who nominated me for this chair, and the many opportunities to engage with him and others within the school during these past few months and earlier visits. I have come to know several PhD and postdoctoral researchers, and I'm very happy to see many of them here today, and also some faculty in the school connected to Willem's work. And I thank them for their participation and contributions to seminars when I visited Erasmus. I especially like to thank uh, Rogier van Riekum, um, of the organizing committee of this day for all of his assistance, but also Marilyn Koistra, who helped with the uh, arrangements during my visit to Erasmus, including the, the production of the written text. Taking up the chair has really been a wonderful opportunity to spend time with many Dutch social scientists, some of whom I've known for many years, um, but also to make new connections. One of the really great benefits of uh, simultaneously holding the chair and the fellowship at NIAS is the opportunity to engage with researchers from a variety of academic disciplines from the Netherlands and beyond, as well as several artists in residence and also writers in residence. Such opportunities, I think, are ever more vital at a time when economic, political, and cultural nationalisms of various sorts are being asserted. I am thus grateful to my co-fellows at NIAS, some of who are here today, and I thank them for joining us, for also helping make NIAS a vibrant and stimulating academic and international environment, and especially to the director, Jan, Val Jan Willem Dijvendak, and the many NIAS staff who've provided wonderful support to me. Finally, I also want to acknowledge the support and contributions of numerous statisticians across Europe, including several from Statistics Netherlands, who have facilitated and participated in the research leading to this research, several of whom I've also had the opportunity to continue meeting with during my time at NIAS. Now, I did not know of Van Dorn before holding an honorary chair in his name, but I can attest to how such a tribute to his work has spawned for me new intellectual and international connections. This is what the chair and fellowship at NIAS have made possible, and for that I am truly appreciative. So thank you again for this honor and opportunity also to deliver my lecture as a keynote at this Day of Sociology. Thank you.